No worries, Jared. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for sorting that out, guys. Those are random, unsorted random unsorted ones. That's all right. We'll, we'll, we'll suss them out if we need them. As long as you've got a 401s, we've got some 411s, that looks good. Okay, welcome everyone to the second half of the lecture. Now, did you notice we were just playing the whole wide world then? From that movie, you might not have seen it, uh, and it had some kissing in it, and, uh, but nonetheless, it also had uh, like pirates and uh, adventures and torture and uh, shrieking eels, and like uh, it was just incredible. So even though it's a kissing film, it's one of the kissing films that I think is a good kissing film. And can I just show you again a little fragment of this because it is just so cool. It's him. Can you, you cannot see it? Yeah, yeah. It's this guy who's, who would have thought he'd turn out to be really funny, but he is. Will Ferrell. Can you hear it? You can't hear it. I don't know how to make it loud. Like, he's a complete geek. This gives hope to us all. <laughs> and he only knows one song, and it's the best song in the world. It's a good song to know. So she's in the kitchen, and as you would, he starts to play. And he's terrible at singing. But he still plays it. It's most excellent. It's very good. We don't have to see it all. But I like this song because he says, uh, there's only one girl in the whole wide world for you and she probably lives in Tahiti. <laughs> and that's advice from his mum. And I just think, <laughs> yeah, it's the, it's the opposite of the advice, of course, your mum would give, she'd say. Keep trying. There's lots of people. There's not just one. See, she's falling in love just because he's singing this song. It's a really good tip. Okay, we don't have to see this, but it's very excellently good. Now the best bit? Okay, just when the, uh, it gets... It is a most amazing film. Make Guitar the Project. Make Guitar the Project? It is the project. Are you reading the wrong spec? <laughs> It's very cool. There's <laughs> just lots of kissing, but it's, it's most excellently good. And so, uh, you know, you can imagine that, that your date's in the kitchen and you're just, you say, I can only write in one language, C. And she goes, have a go, on my, and you go, no. And then she's in the kitchen and you're just typing. <laughs> <laughs> Sits next to you and your eyes are closed and you're just typing. And, you know, you can, see, you can see it happening. It's the most awesome clip. Okay, so I strongly suggest as homework that everyone should definitely watch that movie. Now let's go and uh, go to the lecture notes for this fragment of the lecture. And we're going to have to be fast because we've wasted time having fun. Oh, now if I click that, I'm going to the wrong spot, aren't I? No, click on it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll click on it. Uh, no way! No way! Oh, <laughs> click on it! Oh. <laughs> well done, guys. So who would have done that? So I'm very naughty. 
Um, that was very, very well done. Am I in the right spot? Week 07? No. What do we want? Week 09. Okay, so what do we do? Link lists. Are we real or on YouTube? The whole wide world. That's what we've done. You see, you might think we've got a lot of things that we haven't done yet. Let's just do them really quickly. Um, the tester. When you write your unit tester, you'll notice it spits out a whole lot of output. And if your unit tester fails someone else's play, play of you, then you guys have to resolve between yourself who's at fault. If your test was testing legitimate stuff and their play of you stuffed up, or if um, you were testing uh, crazy stuff and their play of you is completely fine. The only way you can answer that question is if they can see the test. It doesn't matter what their program does. Who cares what their program does? If you have a legal test and they've failed it, they're wrong. So they need to know what your test is. But if you tell them all your tests, that's not much fun. So you could either make your test publicly available and then they can resolve it all without coming to see you. Or you could print out just before doing each test what you're about to test. And then when the thing crashes, they'll see the transcript and they'll work out. They'll also then, unfortunately, get to see every other test you've already done. So, but I guess they're past all those, so it doesn't matter. Um, but the other convention, if you want to follow, you're welcome, is in the output from your tester, every line that explains a test started with an asterisk. And every time they've passed a test, print two asterisks. Does that make sense? So your output looks exactly the same as normal, except whenever you're printing out some information about what you're about to test, that particular line of printout has an asterisk at the beginning. And whenever you've printed out, uh, they've just passed that test, you'd go pass test seven or pass the test on this, you'd put two asterisks at the beginning of that line to say they've passed. Okay. Now, what we'll do, just as a free service for you, is we'll take all the output from your unit tester and we'll throw away any lines that uh, begin with an asterisk uh, that are before the last double asterisk. Does that make sense? So you're, you're saying, asterisk, I'm creating a board that looks like this. Asterisk, this player makes this move. Asterisk, this player makes this move. Asterisk, I expect the result to be this. Double asterisk, all passed. Asterisk, I'm now creating a board like this. Asterisk, uh, this person makes this move. Asterisk, I expect this. Blah, failed, assert failed. We will strip off everything that's an asterisk before that double asterisk that said all passed. So all your previous output from all your tests will be hidden from them. If you want to do that, you don't have to. So you're welcome to clean up your output that way. If you don't do that, then please work out some way you can give them enough information to know whether they've passed your test or not. If they can't tell whether, whether your test is correct or not, we're going to say it's your fault as a tester. So if you just say, sorry, you failed, they'll go, no, I didn't. <laughs> you have to say this and this and this and this and this and, and hence you failed. You don't have to give the whole detail. You're welcome to release all your source code. But there has to be enough that they can check it without having to bother you. Because in the past, we've noticed if people have to communicate to resolve the problem and someone doesn't reply to an email, it never gets solved. So it's completely up to the play of you person to resolve the problem. And you've just got to give them enough information that they can. Now, if your unit tester currently doesn't do that, and you got it in by the Sunday deadline, then don't worry, leave it exactly as it is and everything's fine. But if you submit a new one at all, make sure that the person that um, uh, suffers your test gets enough data to know exactly what you're testing, so if you fail them, they know why they failed. Does that make sense? Yep. They can see what it, yeah, the output of the asserts. You can show whatever output you want. Like, you know when you have an assertion and it prints out the debugging message? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you'll see the whole transcript, including the output of the, all this, everything that goes to standard output is going to get printed. What I said, error. And so it's got a standard error. Everything that goes to standard error is also trapped and sent to standard okay, so output. So read, yeah. If the thing inside the assert line is good enough, but it won't be. The, because you'll be doing like nine moves and then you'll be asserting some condition. And they'll go, X is five? You're asserting X is five and it's not five? How do they know whether X is supposed to be five? They need to know, they need to know what the initial deck is. They need to know what you're about to test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they need to see the failed test. It, it makes sense. And also, if there's a whole lot of other debugging output you're putting in there, please clear that out because it's going to make your transcripts really long and boring for someone to read. So the only output that's coming out should be something you want them to read. Does that all make sense? Yes, yeah, up the back. Can we turn the lights on? It's less intimate with them on. You were getting excited. <laughs> I mean, it's, somehow it's more special when the lights are off. 
But I, I wouldn't want to be sitting next to you now you said that. What's that? Dim the lights. Yeah, the, we've got digital dimming here. It's not like analog continuous. It's, and I can't get it to do more than binary. So, so yeah. Okay, so that's what we've done so far. Let's keep whizzing down just through these points really quick. Lab coats. Uh, I'll tell you about them later on. Correct. Your program has to be correct and clear. What does correct mean? Can someone tell me what correct means? Does what it's supposed to do. How many mistakes will a correct program have? Zero. That's a correct program. Now, at the start of the course, I was assuming that all the people who could already program would be able to write correct programs, and all the new programmers would have trouble writing correct programmers, and that was fine, programs, and that's fine because they're just learning the syntax, and that's completely fine. But of course, once you write a program, it actually has to be correct. You can't say, I built the building, sorry it fell over, or it all works except this door's. You have to make, your program has to be correct. So I hope we didn't lull you into a false sense of security with our early marking schemes, which you could get things wrong left, right, and center, and you just lose little marks for them. Because in the early ones, our objectives were you were learning the syntax, and that's fine. But I did expect that everyone that could already program would make no mistakes at all, no correctness mistakes. But now for this final assignment, it has to be correct. It's not hard to be correct. Just make it correct. If Microsoft can make their programs work, you can make your program, which is much smaller, work. So correct means correct. So if people say, I just failed seven tests, but I passed nine, don't I deserve uh, uh, 9 out of 16? Um, the answer is yes, expressed as an integer. <laughs> OK. Uh, uh, so do make sure everything's correct. Now, the problem with making everything correct is you might think, oh my god, it just needs one little mistake and I'm screwed. You know, I could just get caught out by accident. But no, you can't, because for the next, already now, we've run everyone's tests against your program and you've seen every test you passed and failed. And for the next week and a half, and certainly over the whole tournament, we'll be constantly, every night, running your program against all the tests. So you will know if it's correct or not. And if it's not, you've got lots of times to fix it up. Unless someone changes their tests at the last minute to test for something more diabolical. But why wouldn't they want to change them at the last minute? Because their tests might then be incorrect. Because your, you, your player views are testing their tests every night. Does that make sense? So no one's going to want to monkey around with stuff at the last minute. So, so the idea is, yeah, it's got to be correct. What do we mean by clear? It's got to be clear. Is that clear? <laughs> Have to be able to read the program and it's completely clear. And we don't want to frow our brow at any point. It's just got to be a clear program. So if it's clear, it doesn't have to have perfect style, but it has to be clear. If it's a clear program, it's clear. If it's a correct program, it's correct, and everything's good. If it fails on either of those criteria, then it's failed. It has to be clear and correct. Teamwork. Uh, I just wanted to reflect about teamwork, looking back over how everyone did the teamwork. Um, I've said some things about it already. First of all, I should say how pleased I am to notice that the people that did Eng 1000 seem to have got their teams working quite well. I think Eng 1000 might have made a difference. Eng 1000 is this course that we reckon all first years should do, but you're not compelled to do. Except in one degree, you might. Is anyone compelled to do it? Yeah. Comp Eng. Comp Eng, you're compelled to do it? Yeah, yeah. But everyone else can choose it if they want. And it's all about group work. And it, in theory, you're doing this project to make this thing and thing. But all we really care about is you, you work in groups and you work out how to make it work. Now, everyone's had different group work experiences. Some people were lucky and were within a group of like minded people and everything just worked. Some people, a lot of people, had people that bailed on them and let them down and disappointed. A lot of people bailed on people and let them down, others down and disappointed. A lot of people wanted to work hard and other people didn't let them. A lot of people were in a team where there was a bossy person telling everyone what to do. Some people were in a team where no one took any responsibility for anything and it was a mess. A scary number of people were in teams that didn't start work till Thursday or Friday. The, Tuesday, the Thursday people did fantastically well. The, I was thinking, poor Thursday people are going to be sad because they have less time than everyone else. Most people didn't start till after the Thursday people started. And the Thursday people, most of them, spent the time before Thursday planning. Whereas most people started planning, it seemed, on Thursday or Friday, looking at diaries. It was like, nothing, this is easy, it's going to be a joke, ha ha ha, it's going to be fine. Thursday or Friday, I'm just doing this, it's going to be so cool. I guess I could see my team members, but why bother? And then Saturday, uh-oh. And then Sunday, oh my god. And that, that was the sort of standard thing. So, uh, yeah, so, the, so can I say about teamwork, uh, have I told you the story about teamwork? I did, I did tell the Comp Eng people, where are you Comp Eng? The people doing Eng 1000, everyone that did Eng 1000. I came along and gave one lecture on group work to them and Tim recorded it and if I can find that video I might plonk it up if other people want to look at it. I just chatted about group work in general. But the general idea behind group work is you've got to make it work. 
And if you expect it to just magically work, you're only, it's only going to work if you're very lucky. Nine times out of ten it won't work. It's going to need planning and thought and it needs people to take responsibility for things and it needs people not to be bossy and dictatorial and it needs people not to give up and it needs people not to bail and it needs a, a team that's structured so if someone's about to bail or there's some problem you detect it in advance and you somehow work around it. It needs a team that's all inclusive so everyone feels part of the team rather than the team where you f some people feel left out and it basically needs planning. Now if I said with task two that um, the biggest difference between the successes and unsuccesses and the levels of stress I saw in people were when they started. I would say that for the project, flipping through as many diaries as I could, um, I still haven't seen them all, uh, my thought was starting early was really important. Certainly I don't think I saw any unstressed diaries of people that started on Thursday and thought that was okay to start planning on Thursday. There were still people on the forum asking questions about the spec on Thursday or Friday or how to play the game which had been released the week before. So, that wasn't good. So anyone that started late, that was just led to a whole lot of stress. So they still managed to pull it off, a lot of people. They started late and pulled it off, but they had a horrible time. So A, starting early seemed to be important, but B, planning seemed really important. A lot of teams started early but didn't really plan what they were going to do. They just sort of mumbled around and hoped it would work. The teams that didn't start programming early but actually planned what they were going to do and all the team got together and they made discussions and they discussed ideas and they did a lot of stuff before they started programming and there was a high level of communication between team members before Friday. Those teams seem to have a really relaxed run. In fact some of those teams have grumbled in their diaries saying this task was so easy and it's not fair that we got it done and we're not getting any advantage because other people didn't get it done in time and you know the mark penalty is only a few marks whether you got it done in time or not. And I'm thinking you guys that got it done, well done. You have no idea how far ahead you are of everyone else because everyone else had this horrible, stressed, disgusting time and entered this week with things not finished. So if you started it early and if your team planned and prepared, then you had a fairly easy run. If you didn't, then, then no matter how good a program you were, you had a bit of a nightmare. And the problem with the nightmare on the last day was that that makes you so stressed that you can't think clearly. So a lot of people are making really stupid mistakes and they're able to debug it the morning after they submit it because finally they relaxed and then they go, oh that's what I did and they were able to work it out. You can really only program when you're relaxed so programming it all on the last day that's not good. So I hope I'm not making you tense by saying all this because the whole point of this exercise was to make you think about group work and you've experienced group work and in a way if you experience group work and it worked you're a bit disadvantaged because I'd say most of the course have now experienced group work and seen how it can fail and I'm hoping from that that it will never happen again. And it happened in a course in your first semester where the group work component is only a couple of marks in the whole major assignment. It's worth virtually nothing. So hopefully it was a painless way of learning. Uh, my advice for the future with group work is start early and plan. Okay. Plan groups work out really well. Now the last comment I had to make was just about how people approach unit testing. It seemed to me, though no one said it, that a lot of the groups assigned their weakest person to the weakest programmer to unit testing or left the unit testing till the end and certainly assigned different programmers to the different tasks. I think group work works best when you're actually working together and the idea of writing the unit tests at the end or not putting much interest in getting the unit tests right when they're worth just as much as everything else is to me a, a crazy idea because a lot of people wrote their code and then they wrote the unit tests and then they discovered a whole lot of problems. If you've been writing the unit tests when you're writing the code you wouldn't have discovered all those problems at the end because you would have solved the problems as you went. And if the same person is writing the unit tests and the code at the same time then that's just really smooth development. You know you never get these horrible stressful stuff ups at the end where you suddenly realize everything's wrong and you've got to refactor everything because you discover the problem as soon as it starts to emerge. So can I suggest in the future with testing that you do try and write the tests as you write the code and you do try to take the test seriously and you don't just try to stick them in at the end because I do think that causes a lot of pain. Now in the end you can do it however you want. We're not going to make you do it one way or another but I hope through this assignment you've seen oh if I do it that way it leads to a lot of pain. And it didn't have to lead to a lot of pain. A lot of teams had a nice smooth run all the way through. So if you had pain, think about it and think, hmm, how can I not have pain next time? But let me reassure you that pain, although at the time it seemed terrible, is only a few marks. It's worth bugger all if you look at actually how the marking guide works. The whole, the whole potential of the whole assignment remains before you. You haven't really lost anything at all, but hopefully you've learned something.
Um, all right, that's all I wanted to say. Now, I want, let's go on to lecture four, uh, which is, what, oh, what's, um, I, I can't tell you what lab coats is. I can't. Uh, I'll tell you later on. Uh, the last lecture is, uh, this extension lecture is about CMOS, which is about computer chips, which is about programming stuff. Oh, man. <laughs> Now, I, I, don't, I don't know what you guys think. If I could ever work out who did that, they are so busted. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I'm going to have to revert. That oh, means I've got to log in. Oh, can you put it back, whoever did it? Whoever that person was. Could you, could you, could you put it back? Because I want to jump to this page and I don't want to log in. Just revert. You can't revert? Uh, we'll put it back somehow. Now, um, what we've got is on the... What I was s cycling in today and I realised that I'd lent all my computer bits and pieces to people and I hadn't got some of the important bits back. So I dropped into a shop and bought new bits. And I want to show you the new bits. So let's start by putting it all onto the document camera. First of all, I bought some computer chips. These are CMOS chips. Here they are here. You see them? There. Uh, if I take one out, here's just one. Uh, let me zoom in on one. I don't really want to touch them, actually. Though there is some problem with static, potential problem with static. I mean, it's a very exaggerated problem. It normally doesn't happen. I will, I will. I'll touch something metal first. This is a chip. Yep. It's got 16 pins, or is it uh, 14 pin? No, it's got 16, 16 pin. OK, these are little CMOS chips. And now we're going to assemble something with them, but we don't have a soldering iron. Instead, we're going to use this thing that I bought. Oh, it's so cheap. It's a really um, it's imported from China, and it's heaps better than the <laughs> very expensive ones you can get that are useless compared to this. This is called, it's not very good quality. It's, it's blue plastic. <laughs> um, this is, it's got a speaker, it's got everything. This is called a breadboard. What it means is it lets me, see it's got little hole, lots of little holes in it. Can everyone see that? I'll just walk along so you can see it. Um, you can push wires into this hole and it's got a little spring inside that grips onto them. So instead of soldering wires together, you can just push them in. So you can connect things together by just pushing wires in. Oh, you can put it on the document camera. Yeah, yeah. What's that? You want to stroke it. Very nice. They are really cool. This is a well-made one. Let me put it on the document camera because then I can explain how it all links together. <laughs> yeah. And it's adjustable. <laughs> there, this is the breadboard here. Now, let me tell you how it's connected. Uh, oh, I need, oh, I can actually point on this, can I? <laughs> You'll notice it's just a whole lot of holes. But the neat thing is that underneath the holes are connected. All of these holes in this row along here are connected together with the red on them. All of the, and then you see there's another parallel row of holes next to it. All those blue holes are connected here, on here. Uh, not across the middle. No, so this lot's connected and this lot's connected. And, in th and normally you connect plus and minus electricity to this, your positive and negative terminals to this. And this is what's going to supply us with our power. And then you see there's this big region in the middle here with hundreds of dots. These are connected in rows of five going up. So everyone in that row of five is all connected. Does that make sense? So this is connected to this, 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 and this is connected to this, is connected to this, is connected to this, is connected to this. But they don't connect over this gap in the middle. Does that make complete sense? This is going to let us join things together. What are we going to want to join together? Computer chips. So let me show you the chips I got. Um, let's pick one of them. The four, uh, 4069s. These are a really common one. So these guys up here, CMOS 4069 chips, made by a range of manufacturers. So you just ask for a CMOS. Can I just say, I went to Dick Smith to try and buy all this stuff, and all they sold was like phones and iPods and things. I don't do any more electronics. So I had to go to J Car. Yeah, so everyone should go to J Car and fee to Dick Smith, because Dick Smith was started by Mr. Dick Smith himself, because there was no place that hobbyists could go to get electronic components. What's that? I, I didn't rub out the flag. You, you said the words, rub out the flag. 
That, that's, oh, so did I. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, here's what we do. I went to JK and I bought uh, a CMOS 4069. Now, I've shown you before how we can connect transistors together to do stuff. And do you remember we could connect transistors together in such a way that we made a circuit? Suppose I can't remember the details. I'm just going to draw it as a shady blob that had um, an A going into it and a B coming into it and an X coming out of it. Do you remember that? And we found if A was 5 volts or if B was 5 volts, then X was 5 volts. And if they were both 5 volts, X was 5 volts. But if they were both 0 volts, X was 0 volts. So essentially, if we say 5 volts is yes or true, the output was true if either or both of the inputs were true. And this is what we call an OR. Oh, Alex, you don't have to. It's fine. Are you, uh, Alex? Yeah, you don't have to do it. By the way, you're looking worried. I forgot to tell you, you don't have to do anything. Everything's okay. Good, good. <laughs> Sorry. That's a message I should have delivered before. I forgot. Um, and also there was electricity coming into here, so we had 5 volts coming in to give it power, and it was somehow connected to 0 volts. you remember that? So there's like, if you look at it just as a blob of stuff, there were five wires connected to the blob. Four of them were inputs, and one of them is an output. Now, can you see that this blob is sort of computing a function? The output is sort of a function of the inputs. And although there were transistors and all sorts of elaborate, complicated stuff inside that you've probably forgotten about now, I'm going to say, let's use abstraction. And let's say we don't care what's inside there. We just care about the behavior of the circuit. And I'm going to simplify this picture by drawing it like this. This is the shape I'm going to use to mean OR. And I'm going to sort of have this being the input and this being the output. So this is A and B, A, A, that's B, and this is the output X. And the output will be high voltage if either of the inputs are high voltage. And that's how I'm going to draw this picture without actually drawing any transistors. And can you see, I'm just trying to make it look like a function call. I'm abstracting. Is everyone cool with that? When you abstract a whole lot of gates together, like well, a whole lot of chips, a whole lot of transistors together like this to make one blob. That blob is called a gate. It just means it's more abstract than a transistor. Now there are lots of ways of making OR gates using transistors and I've shown you one. Who cares which one we use? The one we're actually going to use today is the CMOS way of doing it, the standard way that CMOS chips do it. And there's actually lots of ways of doing it in CMOS. So this is just one of the ways it was done in CMOS. So if I wanted to actually compute some ORs, I could connect a whole lot of transistors myself, or I could buy a computer chip that already has some ORs in it. And similarly, there are some other gates you can get. This is called a knot. How does a knot work? If a true comes in here, oh, I need a dot, do I? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, otherwise just a buffer or something. Okay. If a true comes in here, what comes out? False. If a high comes in, a low comes out. If a low comes in, a high comes out. Yeah, that's a not gate. And this, can anyone guess what this is? And. It's an and gate. If they're both true, then that will be true. Okay? So now I've shown you four, uh, three basic sorts of gates. I've bought these chips. These chips are loaded with gates that we can use. And we're now going to start connecting some gates together. Let's look at one of the chips, the 4069. And we're going to look at it by going on the internet, unless someone's rickrolled Google. <laughs> and we're going to say 4069 CMOS. You can't see it, OK? I just Googled 4069 CMOS. And <laughs> let's have a look. Oh, this looks good. I did find a reasonably good one before. Let's have a look at this. Oh, no, that's hopeless. I've seen that one. Uh, I want to see a picture of it. Yeah. Here we go. What's that? Click images at the top. I'm not trusting any clicking things now. <laughs> Uh, that, none of this looks any good. Data sheet. Data sheet. Data sheets. Yuck. I just want to find someone that's got a nice picture of a 4069. Ah, there we go. That looks good. No. It's just a, <laughs> it's, it's a very nice picture, but it's not the picture I want. All right, I'm going to go back to our class notes. I did put it in the class notes. I don't know if it's still there.
Uh, thank you. CMOS data. Yes, that's it. That's it. We're in. Woohoo. This is a web page that has a whole lot of pictures of all the chips. Let's find the 4069. Oh, it doesn't have a picture of it. Oh, man. Wikipedia. Yeah, 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 yeah. 4069. Wiki. What? No. Oh, hang on. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to put CMOS in there. You're right. Uh, isn't that the one? Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. All right. 4069 is what I want. 4069. <laughs> Hex inverter. Oh man, are there no pictures of the 4069 hex inverter? Images. Where do I go? Images. Where? Where is it? Back. Images. There. Ah! <laughs> I should have done that all along. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Let's go. That is the Australian National Anthem. Now, here's what it looks like. Here's a very high resolution picture of the chip. Can you see there's um, how many wires coming out of it? Seven on one side, seven on the other. 14 wires coming out. This is what it looks like under a microscope. If I've got a 4069, it is a 14 pin one. The one we were looking at before was something else, a 4076 or something. Uh, you can see that two of the pins or I'm about to tell you, the two of the pins, pin number 7 and pin number um, 14, are used to supply electricity to the whole thing. And then if I want a gate, I can get one out of pins 1 and 2, and there's ones out of pins 3 and 4. So if I stick a high in pin 1, what's going to come out of pin 2? A low. Oh, you got it. All right, let's connect it up now. So you can watch us do it on the... Uh, uh, oh, now how do I know which one's pin 1 and which one... Oh, the notch tells me on the chip. Does someone remember me? The notch is at this end, isn't it? Yeah, so this pin has a tiny little notch at one end because otherwise you could turn it upside down and you wouldn't know which was which. So I'm going to put the notch in. So let's make it together. Well, by make it together, why don't I make it and you watch it while I do it. It's very, very easy to make. What's that? Pair prototyping. Pair prototyping. Oh, yeah, we don't have time to do any prototyping. We just, we just, oh, yeah, I see, we're doing it in a pair. Yeah, okay. I'm going to stick it in up the top here. Ah. Do you use excessive force pushing it in? Yeah. Yes. All right, it's in. I pushed it in. Now, I need to give electricity to uh, VDD. Is that plus? Uh, you think I put it in backwards? No, I think I did it the right way. Have you got it in the shh, shh, shh. Yeah, it's all in. Everything's cool. It's all, everything's good. It's looking good. Now, I need to get some wires. It's in the holes. Everything's good. Look. It's not in the holes. It's in the holes. The pins. I haven't bent the pins. <laughs> it's fine, for heaven's sake. Now, shh. It's fine. It's fine. Look, can I just show it to someone? It's absolutely fine. Yep, he's right. Thank you. It's just perspective, guys. Now, shh, 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 shh. I've got some wires here, because we need wires to join things together. And I've got some batteries, because we need batteries to give it electricity. So let's give it... Now, how many volts do we want to give the chip? Well, CMOS chips are so convenient. In addition to only costing cents to buy them at electronic stores, they they take a huge amount of power and they're not really fussy. So we, who cares if you get it exactly right? They'll operate more or less on anything between 3 and 15 volts. And they can even operate, out, operate outside that range. Now, at lower voltages, they don't, they don't operate as quickly. But we're not going to be operating this at megahertz. So that's absolutely fine. So let me just stick these in. Uh, oh, how do I connect? Oh, OK. We're going to look at the batteries. Richard has to get power to it. So let's go up here. We put one battery in that way. Is that right? Ah, cheap Chinese stuff. <laughs> and, and one battery in this way. Oh, 
man, I need some. Uh, I should have got an Australian battery. Yeah, this is 10% bigger. <laughs> okay, let's go. Get it in. All right, this. So I'm going to operate it at six volts. That's pretty nice voltage to operate it. And I'm going to put this one in and here. There we go. Now, I uh, better connect all the wires together. I bought some wire strippers too. And when you get wire to do this, make sure you get single strand wire. That really fancy, pretty multi strand wire, which is all soft and bends easily, you can't poke it into the holes. So you want old telephone wire or something like that. So here we are. Let's grab a blue and a red. So I'm going to grab some blue. Uh -huh. It costs virtually nothing. Yep, so I've cut. Uh, <laughs> All right, I've cut two pieces of wire. Now I'm going to strip them off. Don't leave the bits of plastic on the floor when you're finished. See what I'm doing? This just strips it in one second. Normally I strip them with my teeth, but my dentist is not happy that I've done that. <laughs> Okay, so I've stripped these bits of wire and I'm just going to join the battery thing together because it didn't come already joined. Ah. Here we go. Yeah, shh, 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 shh. Okay, so let's see. Uh, oh, these do all join together. No, it's perfect. Oh, that's really good. Okay, so the blue one is the... Um, uh, uh, what, red is plus, isn't it? So let's say the blue one is the minus. <laughs> oh. So I'm just going to, this is high tech here, because I don't have, I really should, so, careful what? <laughs> nah, it's all fine. Six volts, I'm okay. Uh, and I'm just going to plug him in somewhere into this su supply rail, I'll plug it up here. Okay, so I've now given it, can you see? So I've now given the um, uh, plus, I've connected the plus and now I'm going to connect the minus. With some red. I didn't realise all the batteries were actually properly connected together. They are actually. It's quite a nice design. It's a very nice Chinese design. Let's connect the red one up. Okay. And that is going in the red hole. There we are. Now, can you see what I've done? Now I've supplied power to those rails. Now, I want to supply power to the actual chip. Uh, and the plus is, uh, does anyone remember where the plus is pin number? That's the 14. It's this one up the top here. All right. Oh, you can't see it? Let's move him down. So let's give power to the chip. Where's my bits of wire? Here's some we prepared earlier. That have already been cut, see? So I don't have to keep cutting them like that. I just want to show you how easy it was to do. So let's um, get a red one. We're going to connect plus to this pin here. Oh, doesn't quite reach. It's all right, we can bend it. Yeah, you could use staples. I need a bigger one, that's right. Oh, is that cool? And I'll get a bigger one for the black. It didn't connect? All right. I'll, unfortunately, that's the longest red one I got in that packet of wires, so I'll make myself a red one. The color of the wire is like the name of a variable. Hang on. Here we are. I'm doing another connector just to make sure it really works. Okay, now that's definitely connected. Oh yeah, I need to go one down. Thank you. This is like, uh, like it's, it, I, I have been in my life continually amazed by how similar doing electronics is to doing computing. And that it involves the same sort of debugging, the same sorts of mistakes, and the same sort of method, methodical and neat approach seems to be essential for any form of success in, 
involves the same amount of frustration when things don't work. Okay, so, shh, 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 shh. And this last one here is, this one is the minus, I believe. And let's connect, I need a longer wire. Oh, I might have a long, I might have, no. Yep, here we go. Shh, 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 shh. Keep concentrating. Uh, the blue wire, I'm going to connect the two blue power rails together so I can come in from the other side. And then I'm going to go into the chip here. All right, so can everyone see what I've done? I've now powered the chip. The chip now has power. Let's see what happens. The um, plus goes into here comes out with that shiny wire at the top and into the pin of the chip. The minus uh, is the blue, goes to here, goes all the way up to the top, arches across, comes all the way down the side and jumps back across into the, is that in the right pin? Into the last pin of the chip. So the chip is now powered up. So if we go back to our picture of the chip, here's what it looks like. I've now put minus into number seven and plus into number 14. And now I'd like to stick a sample signal into one and see what comes out of number two. In five minutes, easy peasy. Now, how do I stick a signal in? Shh, 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 shh. Well, what signal do we want to put in? Suppose I put in a zero. Let me get a very long wire for this. It's going to be my little proby test. I'm going to stick in, which is pin number one? This is pin number one here. Okay, now if I put, if I plug this into minus to zero, what's coming out of pin number, the next pin? A plus, see it works. And if I plug it into plus, what comes out of the next pin? Minus, minus. see it works. <laughs> oh, you guys want some sort of unit test. Okay, so how can I know what's coming out? I could work it out with a voltmeter. Now I did bring a voltmeter. But much better would be to shine a little light. Now let me tell you what happens in a chip. We stick some voltages into here. If I stick 5 volts into here and 0 volts into here, what comes out here? 0 volts. If I stick 5 volts into here and 5 volts, or let's say 6, because that's what I'm using at the moment, 6 volts in and 6 volts in, what comes out here? 6. If I stick 0 volts in here, what comes out here? 6 volts. Okay. Now. In chips, normally these voltages travel around and they convey information. We just care if they're high or low. They don't do any work. So we don't care about how much current is flowing. We just care about what the voltage is. But it is electricity and it can actually do work. And that's like a side effect. It's like a computer program. You know, it just goes around doing stuff. And it's not until it has a side effect and it does some actual work that the outside world can see a number on the screen or hear a beep or whatever, that the computer program has actually done something. Similarly with CMOS uh, or with chips, nothing happens till we get a signal to the outside world, get some sort of side effect. Now, when, if I got six volts coming out here, what could I do with six volts? I could turn on a light, I could power a fan, I could run the lifts in K17, I could run the, the outside garden lights. Uh, yeah, probably six volt lights at home or 12 volt lights. But there's a problem. If I wanted to run the lift in K17 on six volts, and suppose it was a six volt lift, what does it need? An awful amount of current. How much can these guys put out? Bugger all, current, B-O, <laughs> A. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, the O there was just saying, no, it's not just B. Uh, because the circle here means the opposite. So if I was actually going to write a gate like this, that's called a NAND gate. It calculates A and B and then inverts the output. So true and true is true, and then that gets inverted to false. Yeah, yeah? So little bobblies on the end actually flip the meaning of everything. So a triangle by itself means nothing, but with a little bobbly, it's a flipper. OK, so I've got six volts coming out. It doesn't put out much current, but CMOS does put out enough current to drive an LED, a light-emitting diode. And I did buy some, which are... Here, a little bag of them. See, little, little pretty lights. So let's get one. Which colour do you want? Blue. <laughs> blue. I don't have a blue one. Green. Green. Red. Orange. Now this is an LED. It's a light. Shh, shh. One of these legs is long and one of them short. The short one, if I remember right, is minus. Is that right? 
All right. So it's a diode, so if I flip it the other way, it'll be fine. Now, the diodes actually only really want about 2 volts to make them work. So if you pump 6 volts into a diode, it's got more than it needs. Does that make it happy? No. 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 It actually, because of the actual diode drop, it actually needs a precise voltage. But luckily, this guy here is so weak and pathetic that um, if the diode says, it says 6 volts, and the diode says, no, 2 volts, it goes, oh, OK, 2 volts. <laughs> um, it's just putting out so little current that it, it, it the, the, the um, so, you, I mean, you could put a resistor and do all sorts of fancy stuff, but you can actually just directly connect them. But the problem is it will drag that down to about two volts when I connect them directly. So I can't use this signal to plug into something else then. Does that make sense? Once I've plugged the light into it, it's like the observer effect. Once I've observed, it actually buggers the output up. It's no longer six or zero volts. It's actually going to make it two in a mess. So if I've got six volts coming out here, how am I going to make this light go on? Well, I could, if this is my LED here, I can't remember how to draw them, some sort of triangular thing. Uh, if I put this into the, I've got a short one and a long one. Uh, oh, I'll draw them the other way around. A long one and a short one. If I make the six volts go to the long one and the short one go to earth, then when that's six volts, there's six volts across it and it'll turn on. Does that make sense? So let's do that. We'll make the short one, here we are, go to earth, which is our red wire, and the long one, go to our pin. Here we are. So the long one, can you see it? I've just bent it a bit. It looks like this now, can you see? <laughs> the long one's going to go into the output pin, and the short one's going to go into the red or the blue? blue. The blue. Blue is minus, isn't it? <laughs> there we are. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> Works! Oh. Ta-da! It's working. Now, if I unplug the input here, because currently the input's going to minus, so the output's high, what if I made the output go low? I mean, if I made the output go high... <laughs> what would happen if I made the input go high? The output would go low. And if it's putting out zero volts, and there's zero volts across the diode, the diode will switch off. So I can take it out. It's just all crazy now. And now, boom, boom, it's gone off. Does that make sense? How do we verify that that's no different than simply being unplugged? Uh, oh, well, you could chain two of them together. You could do a knot knot. Let's do a knot knot. Do we have time? No. Yes. no. Yes, we do. We not, not, not have time. Uh, it's funny because we've got so many chips. Uh, next week, how about I show you some more stuff and we'll build something more elaborate? Okay? All right. Go, go, go. 